Hi everyone, uh, this is Anurag, one of the co-founders at True Foundry, uh, and today we have with us Ayush. Uh, so True Foundry, uh, we are enabling companies to train and deploy machine learning models, including large language models, to production in a scalable way and at a cheaper cost. And through this series of two ML talks, we bring to you like some of the good platforms that big tech companies have built. Uh, Ayush is one one of the senior ML engineers at Pinterest. Uh, where he is leading uh, the work on the ad side, working on privacy-related uh, uh, challenges, uh, something called privacy conversion modeling that he uh, mentioned. And prior to that, he has also uh, been associated with Netflix uh, as well. Uh, he also kind of uh, has done a number of papers on the ML side. Uh, we'll leave it to Ayush to kind of do a detailed introduction. Uh, I'm sure everyone is aware of Pinterest. It's a almost $20 billion com listed company. And it's one of the biggest uh, social media platforms that allowed you, allows users to use images and videos to discover the power of ideas. And uh, like uh, according to the public figures, they claim to have like more than 300 billion ideas uh, that people kind of have uh, through the Pinterest platform. Uh, so Ayush, it's a pleasure to have you uh, and look forward to the chat today. Thanks Anurag for the wonderful introduction. I look forward to the chat today too. Uh, Ayush, maybe uh, it will be great to kind of talk about your journey. Uh, you have spent like almost five years now at Pinterest. So how has the journey been? Uh, what has been the challenges? It will be great to kind of uh, start there. Yeah, I think I joined Pinterest right out of college in 2018. It's been like around five and a half years now. But I think the journey has been rewarding and enriching in general. I joined the ads business around 2018, like Pinterest was mostly focusing more on the ads business as that was just starting to begin in general. So I, so one of the good point about my journey at Pinterest was that I could see the transformations in general that you might not see at bigger companies as they, they have already grown by the time you join them in general. So I joined in 2018 on like a conversion optimization product. So this is like a third party offsite ads product in general. And if you look into ads business, like this is what the advertisers care about. So what this means is that let's say if you are at Pinterest, like Pinterest has a lot of advertisers, specifically let's say Walmart. But what you want to drive is like conversions on your website in general, not necessarily clicks on Pinterest. So this is the product and Google and Facebook already have these products in general. So we knew that this product is going to win. It was matter about how do you build it for Pinterest use cases in general. So. So the good part was when I joined, this product was just in the design phase, like nothing had been written. So I could work on it in general and see the end-to-end -end thing in general. And, and the aspect of not only working on machine learning, but working on developing products from scratch in general. And how do you like maybe converse across different teams, including sales, front end, and like product managers. And that was a good experience in general. And, and the other good benefit was like conversion product in general. Today, for Pinterest is one of the top most ad product in general because this is very closely tied to what the advertiser is looking for in general. But also during my time at Pinterest, like I got to work around many foundational projects in general. Like back in 2018, like ML stack was, I think the ML platform team at Pinterest was also building around that time. I think they had the first hire around that time. So that was a time when Pinterest was still private. You could still like do many, like, like you don't have boundaries in general and you could do anything that you want to do in general. But even then, if you look in, even in 2018, like Pinterest was at forefront of machine learning already. Like Pinterest used to, is a pioneer for, I would say like graph neural networks in general. Like we used to have like Yuri, who is a pioneer of graph neural network. And most of the graph neural network work had already been productionized before I came in. So yeah, I think those were good times in that particular sense. But when I came in, I think I worked on a lot of like ads ranking components in general, like working on a lot of ads ranking models and then more on conversion optimization. And since last two years, I think this landscape has changed dramatically with Apple and Google announcing more privacy restrictions on usage of this data to make it more, give more power to users in general. So, but the question is, how can you make sure that personalization is still effective so that you can still have value for advertisers, but also respect the user privacy, which is like a very crucial time for the industry right now, which I think is good and beneficial. I think you're lagging those controls and having them in place. I think that the good part I see, it brings more innovations, like in directions that you're not looking into before. So now you have more innovative ways to, to like 
do it in a way that you can still have user privacy respected. So I think that makes it really challenging and interesting, I would say. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and the journey, uh, Ayush. Uh, it'll be good to uh, maybe share the scale of the ML platform at Pinterest before we dive into, you know, the uh, the other areas. So, so that users get a perspective of the huge scale that Pinterest is serving uh, through its yeah, yeah, some of the public figures, I think currently Pinterest has more than like 400 million like globally monthly active users. I think Pinterest has a very rich corpus, like we have around 330 billion pins that have been indexed into the platform naturally, organically or through our creators in general. And these pins are like images, but they also have like in the back end, they also have like images which are tied to some websites in general. So we have a big like good mix of images text descriptions in general, which gives us like a very heterogeneous, like heterogeneous platform to, to analyze and do machine learning on in general. And these are spread across like 7 billion boards in general. So we like that's the scale. In terms of languages, Pinterest is like available in around 35 different languages. So it's multilingual. And also one, one thing about Pinterest in terms of like social medias, like perception like pinterest is perceived to be a place which is filled with positivity in general like based on surveys around i would say like 91 percent people like reported that pinterest is a very safe place so people don't feel that they're wasting time on it i think they feel inspired to create a life they want to love in general so i think that's like a positive corner of of the world or the internet right now in general. Understood. great uh great and, and how many like uh, you know um uh, just maybe uh, diving on the ML side, like how many models would you all be having in production uh, at any point in time? And what is the scale uh, in terms of the serving scale? Like like how many requests these models would be serving uh, on a per minute, per hour, whatever? Yeah, so I think Pinterest, yeah, I think in terms of machine learning, Pinterest has a big machine learning team in general. Like in terms of productionization, like at least on the ad side, like the team that I work on, our team owns like, 20 different models serving different objectives in general. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, I would say. Then we have yeah. different components like that are doing different parts of our ecosystem. They would have like five, six. I would say at least at a time, like diff like I would say the high priority models would be more than around like 50, 50, 60 different models being iterated for all different perspectives in general. One of the things is we do like real time serving, like every like, every recommendation is real time. So one of the thing is we want the latency to be pretty low in general. So I think latency in some like hundreds of milliseconds in general. So now you need to work to make sure that your, your systems are like real time, but also more responsive. So there's a lot of different work in the background that goes in to make sure that whenever you're interacting on the platform, it gets captured quickly in general. Okay, awesome. We'll we'll dive into those. So let let's start with the ad side. Like you mentioned about some of the challenges that come with ads, but uh, maybe give a picture. I use of some of the uh, the entire funnel of you know when you're looking at the ads business and how ML impacts it. What are the different areas where ML plays a role, uh, and then relating it to maybe uh, you know uh, the work that you are doing as well, uh, so that people can understand the overall. Uh, plethora of uh, work on the ML side and ads uh, side, including some of the things you touched upon earlier, like privacy aware conversion modeling and things like that. Yeah, I think I, I would say like ads is a very good complex ecosystem which brings like many different fields together. So that's an interesting aspect of ads and machine learning touches all different components of this pipeline. So to give an idea how how ads work in general is like like advertisers would have some some budget they would have some okay this is my hundred dollars that i want to spend on pinterest so there would be like a ui based system where they could spend like they could choose which kind of objective they want to optimize for in general so one of the first machine learning touch point comes at this point is mm -hmm. the company gives you forecast like okay if you choose this product like what's what's your kind of reach would be like how many users or pinners would you reach to like what would your performance be so so the advertisers get an option during that step based on some machine learning models that can help you to choose like what kind of optimization would be ideal for you so now the first step also comes here is that advertiser needs to choose between different image styles that they can use so depending on that you can share them some insights okay this might work better for the audience on pinterest or for the audience that you're selling 
then you have insights around like machine learning models deriving insights like what would be a good time to sell like what would be a good trading point like how much do you want to bid on different actions so there are some of those like that happen in the background called under like media planning and all of those things the other thing is once let's say advertisers has given the objective advertisers has told you about like what they want to optimize for from there it works around like ads like what we call as ads ranking or like like okay. delivery systems in general so these are more responsive real time systems in general now given that you have like millions of like advertisers like mi millions of pins that can be potential ad candidates but you'd want to make sure that you can optimize the delivery for advertisers but you also right. want to make sure that you don't hurt your pinner experience you can't bombard people with ads so you need to find ads that are personalized so to getting to ads that are personalized for the user, there goes a lot of machine learning involved in there. So now the concept is since the corpus is too large, like you can't rank and score all ads all, at all the time. So in general, you have like always like a funnel kind of architecture where you have like two, two towers, like you have like different, different funnel pieces in general, which are like catering to different use cases. So the first piece of this funnel in general is targeting. Like targeting is about like advertisers might have their objectives that they only want to show like to specific age groups, to specific gender, or maybe to specific location, or like only target when some keyword, like when some keyword is being active. So now what keywords you can expose are through machine learning models in general. So let's say if you have so far, can you expand it to furniture on different things? So those are exposed to different machine learning models, which are on the offline side in general. So they are not like that real time. But once you have these targeting principles that you can adhere, but now when you when a user comes to Pinterest, you need to make sure that you show ads only that are relevant to this targeting criteria that this user falls in. So, so now first step is about targeting. The, how do you identify getting these targeting ads in general? So there are like different ways to do that in general, but like it's more on the, I would say infrastructure side at this point, but after targeting, once you know, okay, these are the ads that you can show to the user, but still you cannot rank all those ads through sophisticated models. So you want to have a system that can control how many you can, you can land. So eventually I think from, like a million pins, we narrow it down to like maybe 2000 candidates that we want to run completely in general. So there's a retrieval step. So retrieval, I think there's been a lot of research into retrieval too in general, where you have like kind of, I think two tower is something what everyone is doing right now. So you have to, like you learn a user representation, you learn a pin representation through like deep neural networks. From pin representations, you index them through like approximate nearest neighbor algorithms, and then you do a query, you retrieve them, and there's a lot of optimizations there in general. How do you manage this index and what kind of models you train? Like prior to this, I think back, I think three years ago, that was not the case. I think people were relying on like ad hoc logic. So I think things have converged in general into using the two tower architectures, which are more scalable and more personalized in general. So once you have these like retrieval candidates, you want to get more precise predictions so that you can use for ranking your ads. So precise predictions is mostly called as like L2 ranking or like level two ranking in general. And then you do these predictions through like deep neural networks or like more complex architectures in general, which can take a lot more information around. And then once you have like a probable list of candidates, you have like how do you rank those candidates? What are your different components? It, it boils down to mostly a multi-objective problem in general. Like you have different objectives. You want to satisfy advertiser, but you also want to make sure that your users are happy. You also want to make sure that you are generating revenue. So how do you balance these three in the equation? I think there's some machine learning simple algorithms that go in there. Then lastly, I think once you have all this, how do you rearrange this? You don't want your product to show the same content at the same time for the same user, you probably want to have some diversity. So how do you blend this, rearrange them? So machine learning goes into that aspect. And then, then you show it. And I think then there's a ton of different, like how do you log this data? How do you train this model? So I think there's a lot of different architectures there, but in a nutshell, I think there are different, like these different touch points around machine learning in general in the arts ecosystem. Okay. No, the, that that is a really good uh, you know description of the overall funnel. Uh, one question you mentioned about the retrieval systems, like how has like Gen AI, LLMs, etc., been influencing the work that you all are doing on the ad side? I uh, uh, could kind of quickly touch on that. Yeah, I think LLMs and I think Gen AI are like very uh, interesting field, and I think Pinterest and everyone is staying top of it in general right now. 
in particular, I, I, I think there are many new use cases of Gen AI in general, like for Pinterest in general, because Pinterest is like a visual discovery engine. Yeah. So there's like a lot of use cases that you can think about around images, around, around those concepts. But I think I'm not sure. I think it's still very early right now in Pinterest okay. journey to share. I but see. I think, yeah, I think in few time, but I would say Pinterest is definitely actively working. And I think that's a very hot topic these days in general. Got it. Uh, so going back to the ad space, like uh, ultimately to power uh, this these different use cases, where a lot of these seem to be like uh, you know very high scale, low latency systems uh, uh, serving real time. Uh, maybe give an overview of the overall uh, you know architecture of the uh, ML platform layer that kind of powers uh, these different kind of models. Um, and then we'll dive into maybe the training side and the deployment side, but high level, um, what, what is the platform built on? Um, and yeah, a, a description of the same. Yeah, I think mostly right now at Pinterest, like I think the platform is kind of a unified platform in general. Like mostly all the teams, I think we call it ML in, in general, but mostly all the teams utilize a unified platform. And one of the reasons is that like, at least the last year or maybe more than like two years ago, we, we used to have ad hoc ad hoc different platforms everyone is maintaining different parts of the infrastructure by themselves this allowed people to work fast but i think in general we realized later that you can't reuse technologies that have been developed in that respect and spinning up new new ml ecos like ml task in general was harder so over time pinterest spent effort to unify so when i say we unified it like our ml infrastructure is unified like everything is in python all teams have in the same code base in general and you can reference use other other code that has already been written in that libraries in general we utilize python for most of our programming in general there's a big push around pytorch recently like we are utilizing pytorch for training and serving for some of the benefits that it brings and also we are seeing in the industry and also in academia that pytorch is more popular right now which which might be a controversial statement to say but yeah i think pytorch is where we see that people are growing and also at pinterest like pinterest had a good pytorch pytorch experience engineers early on in general so we have more in-house expertise in pytorch too in general and then I think for like training that like, we also have a unified like feature infrastructure right now in place. So okay. now we have a unified feature store, which we call as Galaxy internally. But yeah, I think there you can have, you can index your features. Then we also have a unified like backfilling tool. So you can choose which table you want your features to be like joined with in general. So that's also there. Then we also like we use Airflow, like a version of Airflow for our models, like workflow, orchestration, task in general. We also have an inbuilt like library on top of Airflow in general. So something that we see with most of like machine learning algorithms, specifically with data pre-processing in general, like sometimes you might pre-process data which has already been pre-processed by another workflow in general. So you don't want to duplicate storage or waste resources. So we have a lineage tracking system inbuilt on top of like airflow, like using airflow, but like another library that's in built to control the lineage of ML models in general. So one thing that we realized like people train a lot of models, then you have a lot of storage on S3. Some of it is just wasteful, like you're just because people are just reusing it. Over time, we also realized that you don't want like a lot of data pre-processing away from the model. So I think there's a big push to push data pre-processing inside the model trainer so that the time and the compute is saved in general in that perspective. We use Airflow, then we use like MLflow for our like model, like all the life cycle, the metrics for the models in general, like what, what's going on so that we can track them. On top of that, we also have like inbuilt tools that look at different parts of a model life cycle, like what's the training, is the training data set ready, when what it was trained, like Pinterest has been training incremental models since like I joined, like we have been training incrementally for ads models in general. So like what's being trained, when it's being deployed, and then if you need to roll back something, you have like provisions to do that. We use like Spinnaker for our like deployment schedules in general, like we move to Spinnaker. So yeah, I think over time we moved away from inbuilt to open source, I would say tools in general, like we are using some inbuilt tools. And I think if it comes with its benefits in general, like you can get, like you can choose which one works best in general in that perspective too. And right. then yeah, I think that's training. We use Kubernetes 
for training and managing our workflows and like the GPU resources for training. Then we also have like, I think in, in terms of platform, I think you also have like capacity to train on your own Amazon, like EC2 instances or like Amazon GPUs, but also like you can like own the G, like you can have your dedicated GPUs, but you can also use it from the cluster directly. Some of right. the cluster, I think that's what we also have. Then in terms of like, we have the continuous deployment through Spinnaker, we do a lot of monitoring on the metrics, validations there. And yeah, I think we serve through like PyTorch. We have like Torch script serving right now in place. We also have like an inbuilt like server, like app server that we have. So I think for the scale at printers, we had to do a lot of optimizations in general. So I think that's also one of the reasons is also like printers started when the open source community was not like, we didn't have that many solutions in open source around that mm -hmm. time. And then you do a lot of optimizations in the first place on your servers. It becomes harder to move away from it to in general. So I think that's like, if you go in one direction, like coming out would be harder. And right. challenging, so I think that's something I think, but I think Pinterest still has use case for like in-house, like serving systems in general that's optimized for that purpose. Yeah. Got it. Uh, cool. I think that, that's, that's uh, good to kind of get an overview. Maybe uh, we can deep dive a little bit more on the uh, training side of things, uh, Ayush. Uh, you mentioned that you all use Kubernetes for spinning up your uh, training resources. Uh, maybe give an overview of like how the resource management here is taken care of because there are hundreds of data science folks and everyone kind of spinning up GPUs because it could be a huge cost to the system. So how do you kind of do resource management uh, on the training uh, side uh, primarily? Um, that, that will be great to kind of understand. I think resource management, yeah, I think that has been a very like uh, important topic recently too. I know like Amazon has some shortage of GPUs too. So I think you can't keep on requesting more GPUs. And also right. this year has been a year of like efficiency in general. You don't want to waste the resources you have. So there are like two. So we have two concepts primarily here. One is like production workflows, like workflows that are running in production. You want to have highest priority there. So we have different like tier tiered systems in general. So production workflows have their dedicated queue. They cannot be preemptive. They have like dedicated like size of GPUs that would be available to them at that time in general. So, so that separates out our production workflows from like team level workflows. Now in terms of team level workflows, like we have like some, what we call as like fair share, like every team can request like a fair share in general. Like this is what this team, like import, like this is what team needs how much they need in general. And they can like probably, like we have governance teams who can like, you can work with in general to increase your fair share, then probably you need to like finance accounting of what you're doing. So fair share, but also fair share also means that some teams might not be using their fair share in general. So mm -hmm. the team can still use, because if you have GPUs that are lying idle, that's also not useful. So you can still use GPUs. So we do have like other, like fair share is just like, if everything is full, you don't have resources, then you can probably start to preempt jobs from other 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 queues in general, so as to make space in general. But anytime, like you would have some kind of safety net in general, like you would get priority to get scheduled in general. And also there's a lot of optimization and tracking around, like what are the high high jobs in general? So let's say even if you want to preempt, like what if this job is already about to finish and it was taking like yeah. six, seven hours in general, you don't want to like finish that preempted that suit. So based on priority, there are some like logic rules that people have so that you can still keep things going, working. And what we see is normally, there might be times where you would have more load on the system, depending on mm -hmm. the, like, because for ads, right, if the data is ready, all the models start training at the same time. So can you stagger that up so that you, you don't like, you don't use too much of your GPU resources. And also I think a lot of work around profiling in general, some of the tasks might not GPU, but you're spinning up GPUs. So can you optimize your like GPU to CPU kind of structure so that you don't need that many GPUs. And sometimes some tasks might not be useful to yeah. run, let's say 10 minutes, you can run it in 20 minutes. So can you do it with less GPUs? So I think those are some of the conservation, conservation conversations that are happening so that people use it fairly. Given, I think there's a big shortage in the industry for GPUs recently after the LLM chain, like, like, like the advancements in general. Yeah. Understood. Uh, so, so you also mentioned uh, this concept of like obviously reserved instances and then you know spinning up something on your own. So, 
how, how is that kind of uh, done within the team like is, is there like a basic limit that everyone has access to which is reserved or is it reserved at the team level how, how does that work yeah i think pinterest normally like like we we don't get a dedicated physical machine like we have macbooks in general but we don't have dedicated physical machines so our, our machine to work is always like a spin up machine so you so we do have like every user has one one machine that can they can spin up but also when you spin up you are shown the cost of that machine in general but if the machine is like the high end gpus you probably don't want to spin it up in general and i think the focus is to not have dedicated machines but to make the process seamless like if you want to spin up a machine they have like a time to live let's say for two days you complete your job you finish it and making that process seamless so that you don't need to rely on like dedicated machines because many times we see that those remain ideal in general like so if you can improve this process i think we do have like just changed one one argument in the command line and it changes you from running from the dev app versus on your machine versus like a like a machine that you are requesting on demand in general so that that makes the process okay. seamless and and with ttls i think that make sure that you're not paying too high cost for for doing that kind of work in general got it and and uh, you mentioned about uh, showcasing to the users the cost of the machine like uh, want to understand like uh, is there anything else on the cost side that you all have done to kind of give this visibility so that people are more careful and the reason why i'm asking is um, we we have seen a number of companies where uh you know the data science team and the ml team does not have any visibility on to the cost and they therefore don't go ahead and you know they they can keep on spinning up jobs and it keeps on consuming a lot of resources so want to understand how it has impacted and what all sort of visibility do you provide and how you do that yeah i think yeah i think that's a good point like when i joined in 18 2018 we had no visibility of what the cost is right now i think over time cost has been an important factor and i think people realize the importance of costing based on different organizations different teams within the within the different components of the company so what we have is like every team has a project that they can define let's say if your team if your project works across different teams that you don't want that you want to measure together you can have a different project name So every project has like every team or like work has a project defined in general. For our case, like ads ranking has its own project. So all the jobs that we run are getting calculated. The infra costs are calculated across this project. So one of the importance is you want to make sure not even you're serving like your training costs, all the workflows. Like we have like whatever we run on Airflow have associated costs displayed at part of it. everything that we run on kubernetes show what's the time that the application started what's the cost of that application and then you can sum these up in together in different dashboards to show like okay this organization this particular kind of jobs cost this much in general on cpu gpu on training then also we have cost based on the serving side like what's your serving serving cost of like the models that you have and then i think one thing that was overlooked or like mostly gets overlooked is like what's your cost of storage in general like we have like lot of cost of storage in the past like pinterest doesn't do like everything was being dumped into let's say one one s3 location and then that was yeah. quite a traffic so over time we have like storage directories split based on teams need in general like what's your priority like whether it's a tier 2 tier 1 kind of priority how much fallback like rollback needs to you need so some of those things and then once you do that then you can start to discuss like whether this much data is useful like do you need this are you just storing it and then there are a lot of things that you would not realize like some data is there for four years no one is reading it so now you have some of those access control me- measurements over that like how often is this data being read can we delete it if you don't need it can we save cost there so i think cost saving tra- i think tracking is important and then using that tracking to save your cost i think that that is like i think really important but i would say like it's not like we have been doing it for a long time but i think over time i think you realize that that's something you need to make sure your costs don't don't overshoot the revenue that you're making understood i think i think this is super useful i think uh, that that's a key takeaway for for the users like you know i think uh, it's it's important to kind of have the tracking of the cost so that over a period of time you have visibility into what uh, can be changed to make it uh, better so that that's really nice to kind of know ayush uh one question you mentioned about the storage cost and i'll go back to your point on the feature store side as well uh so with with the creation of this feature store that you all uh, are using um has that led to 
uh, any reduction of the costs around storage or even in terms of you know trans every time the features are accessed versus uh, earlier where where people were kind of you know building their own features at the same time yeah i think it significantly reduced the cost i would say both i think the cost to the infrastructure in general but also the maintenance cost i would say like you know okay how is this feature being used downstream earlier well, yeah, you don't have any clue like how this data is using and if you want to change your versions you don't know who to contact to so it gives you a good lineage in general like how is your feature being impacted when used by and then you also know like how important they are to the downstream teams in general so that kind of maintenance and also the storage i think early, like what we did over time is also move most of the things near to the model training itself so what we used to have earlier is that we used to store many duplicate copies of the same data for use for different purposes in general, and that was ballooning the cost. So right now, you have a unified, like at least for ads, you have one table which has all the rows that are needed for different teams, and you can choose which rows you want to train on. Now, if you want to backfill, like add any feature, you do it once, and then everyone gets that feature. It's not about like you go about doing it for each and every table, which creates like a lot of, in, in terms of like the, EC2 cost to do this operation it remains the same for each of those teams. So you, you save on those costs in general, and you can probably have one copy. And it also in, it also ensures that your data is correct in general. You're not seeing different discrepancies, like different pipelines in different part of the data. And then with this, rollbacks are easier in general. Like when you have a unified feature store, you can probably have more checks of what's being put into the feature store. You can control it in a unified manner. So that you're not like putting just an empty feature blog and all of those checks and drifts. You can check the drifts over time and all those things. And you can also roll back through a more seamless manner in general. So I think that's something that that was like probably a pain in the past, like around rollbacks, because you need to know different parts like where this is going. And then I think that was everything had a different way to roll back. So I think that seamless the operations in general too, in some sense. Understood. And, and uh going into the training side further like uh, how do you all kind of trigger the jobs like do you use like hosted notebooks vs code or uh, what 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 do you use and how have you kind of yeah. uh, so i think there are like two different i think i would say like data scientists like mostly data scientists would work on like jupyter notebooks like they're trying to like do some of they can bring their own libraries into the jupyter notebook they can docker use a different docker image and build all those things they work on that and then we do have support for launching our PySpark jobs through Jupyter in general, like launching launching these jobs to Kubernetes, like just packaging them and send it to our clusters. Like mostly everything happens in the Kubernetes clusters, but like the Jupyter hosted notebooks are connected to it. But for machine learning engineers working directly on the models, like we normally have the pipeline is already built up in general, like what kind of jobs you need and everything, like because we are also training incrementally. So we rely on just like dockerizing the code changes for the trainer in general and just submit it to our like workflow authorization system and that can reference these changes and then you can probably I think that reduces your productionization time and also adds like monitoring. But I think for VS, I think for Jupyter code reviews and stuff, I think that's some cap capabilities that you need in general for productionization too. I understood. And and you mentioned about using Airflow for uh, you know uh, your pipelines, and then you are using MLflow uh, for for logging your metrics, uh, and then you have like this hosted uh, Jupyter notebooks, etc. So all of these systems, like a lot of them, don't have the right access control side because the open source ones don't. So how have you kind of uh, built the access control layer around it? How easy or hard has it been uh, uh, for for you to kind of do the same? Yeah. Yeah, I think access, I, I would say like access control, I think the strongest access control we have is around our Jupyter notebooks in general. Some of okay. the, I think some of like data sets might be more privacy centric in general, and you don't want people to. So I think most of the access needs right now is not for internal employees, like seeing each other's work, but mostly around the data sets that you're querying. So each right. of these have like access, like each, like let's say if you want to, view a restricted data set in general you need to have like an access control which works at the job level right now so mm -hmm. when you're submitting these jobs to kubernetes in general do you have the access to run those jobs and assume the role that needs this i think that's how currently we are focusing right now but yeah i think adding access control 
around this pipeline has been like something which was challenging in general like how do you build this access control in general but right now yeah i think it's mostly on the data set access in general like what kind of data sets you can you can use or not use okay so so uh, the uh, access control and the data set will then uh, flow down uh, d- does it flow down all the way to say even models uh, like that are actually deployed and uh, what is the overall hierarchy of access controls and you know um, where does it start and how does it flow down it will be good to kind of get a sense of how you will have managed it yeah given given privacy is an important topic i think, I think that access i think we have very strict access like there's some data set like it's on the data set level in general so there would be data sets that have like highly strict access not anyone can read it or to write it i think read is like write is even stricter reading is still probably slightly less strict and you have different roles that you can assume and then who can approve you for the roles i think that's also tricky so in in some cases only specific people can give you the access for these data set in some other cases maybe your managers can give you access but like, when you okay. have access what you're doing i think everything is closely logged to so that not you're not misusing the access and also the access is restricted in many cases to maybe one to two days till your work is done so it's not that you have access for everything right. right and everything is being monitored in that perspective then we have tiered access in general like when you have this access it's not like an open access that you can do everything every access comes with a specific location so every job or data set has a access that you need to do so so it's not that someone like anyone can have access to everything so you need to have permissions to access it different data sets and different like every data set level has different access controls in general and then you need to assume the role for each of them and make sure and in some cases like one access might not have access to talk to other in general so you need to make sure that you you unlock that if you need and then if you're writing out something from that access everything is being tracked in general so you you okay. have ways to so that you can't write out if you don't have like something that is not you like even if you have read write but what's your writing is also going to be tracked and made sure that it's it's okay to write it like it's not that you can copy it and write it somewhere else without access so those kind of access to non access has like good good background in general like you can't just keep writing to a location which doesn't have access so that that you breach the privacy so i think there are good restrictions around what you can access and how you are accessing in particular and then monitoring over on top of it in general okay understood and and once you train these jobs you kind of log these metrics into say the ml flow um and suppose you like a model um do you kind of have a concept of a model registry where you kind of store all of these models or yeah i think we have a store like we have different clusters in general so once let's say everything goes through the offline process in most cases offline also has their own validation process looking at some prior data to see whether this model makes sense and we don't have regressions so once we have that you can choose like we don't want all the models that are being trained to deploy so let's say once you train a model okay. offline you can look at the offline metrics okay this looks good now you can probably enter it into like a model registry which which gets deployed differently like like adds l2 like the models like retrieval models would have a different place like different servers where they are deployed but adds model would have but also one of the cases that you don't want to have multiple models like many models on the machine because then you get into a memory overhead in general you can't host that many models you will at some point you only have few, like active models that are being used and like experimented with in general but <clears throat> just a second <clears throat> yeah so you want to add your models to registry once you add your mod so one thing is with pinterest like at least with arts model everything is being incrementally trained so even after you have checked once it doesn't mean that you okay. you are good forever so once you add to the registry the models go through like a validation process same something like you go to a staging environment you check the metrics and then you look at the business metrics of that environment something like how much your prices are how much your click through rate is coming in if there is a divergence in that you probably don't want to push it to your production so you just slow it down you roll, roll it back so one of the thing is these can be noisy in general like how do you make sure that you are getting the right noise like right signal from these kind of analysis i think that comes with i think it's somewhat challenging at some point but i think you probably get to it but you might realize okay your thresholds were too loose you missed something so i think there's some bit of like uncertainty around setting those those bounds how much you want to stop it 
but yeah once it goes in then you can just having passing those checks it moves into your like online like production system but even in the production system when we have new models they all go through like an ab testing phase in general too so like it's not that it goes to all users so it's also controlled through an experiment which goes through ab testing phases in general got it and and uh, you know going into the serving layer you mentioned you all use like pytorch so uh, or quite a bit uh, yeah. right uh, do you do you also kind of have a set of models that you host as like general fast api or task api endpoints and then how how does the choice of uh, this model server come in what has been the benefits of it uh, what are the optimizations or the constraints that matter from a latency perspective and um, you know, cost perspective and what are some of the benefits you have seen of, of using the system say versus some other system you have evaluated yeah i think for pinterest i think the model server predates the time i joined pinterest i think we have been having an inbuilt model serving solution in general one of the i think one of the things that we have i would say is like how do you store your pin features in general and retrieve these pin features in general so what happens like when you have a user request that's coming in you don't you only transmit your user request and the set of pins that you want to rank you don't transmit all of the features in general so you only transit and the model in in its memory cache it holds the pin features in general so the pin features are part of the spot like the model server that we have in general and then you also need a lot of sharding capacity so that you can make sure that you can use your cache effectively in general so same pins might go to like particular server in general so that you, you are utilizing and making sure it's low latency in general so because of those i think printer did a lot of optimizations there now with gpu with cpu i think we didn't use to batch batch the request in general that much with gpus i think how do you batch your request so that you you can batch more requests together so you can get like more performance but also you want to be low latency in general you don't want to keep waiting to batch it so how do you make sure that happens i think those those are some of the optimizations that happened recently around like batching and also utilizing more of the cuda graphs in general so that you can have more faster inferences in general so i think those are something that are keep going on yeah, maybe describe this uh, in more detail, uh, Ayush. Like a uh, lot of companies uh, are with this with this large language models. Like you know, people are forced to move from uh, CPU-based serving to like GPU-based serving. So uh, it'd be good to kind of dive into the optimizations that you all have done uh, there, and uh, how, how did you kind of do it, or how did you build the system? Yeah, yeah I think. Yeah, I think moving to GPU, like from CPU to GPU, I think it needs optimization both on, you know, like model, like what the model you're exporting in general. So you need to analyze like what kind of operations are more GPU friendly in general and what are like causing you to waste cycles. Some of those profiling is critical in general. You need to ensure that it's not about just changing the, the place where you're influencing. You need to make sure that specifically with embedding tables that you have in general, like where you store it on the CPU and those kind of optimizations change. I think that that brings a lot of performance wins in general. The other other aspect that brought gains was around like batching, like around how do you batch your request so that you don't want to send each singular request that's coming into the, to the GPU, but you also want to make sure that, and that is something you tune it, like some models might have different matching, like how much you want to batch, like 128 candidates or 64 candidates, but it also a factor of how much QPS you are receiving and what's latency you want to achieve. But like if your QPS is low, you can't batch, like then probably you need to, like how much machines you can spin up because if you're, if you're batching, you're waiting for a very big batch, but you don't have that much QPS to batch it, probably you don't want to wait that long, you just send it. So I think those are things that are probably empirically designed in general once you once you do it. But I think having the capacity to do that easily, being able to monitor the impact of while you tune this, I think that that's critical. Like if you don't have the capacity, I think that then that becomes much harder to attain in general. Got it. Uh, and and you mentioned uh, you know in gen, uh, like across this journey of five years. Uh, uh, you you all have had to kind of make a number of changes to the uh, overall ML systems, uh, like moving from older architectures to new ones. Uh, maybe if you can uh, throw a little bit light on uh, one or two of these migrations, uh, what are the things? Uh, uh, maybe start from there. Like, uh, what are some of the major migrations of the ML systems that you you all had to undertake uh, during this five years? 
Yeah, I think that's a good question. Like, I think Pinterest, like when I joined, like Pinterest was using like GBDD kind of architecture, at least on the art side, we used to have GBDDs, which were trained through XCBoost libraries in general, which were not in TensorFlow. And then we are training logistic regressions in TensorFlow. And then we had some ad hoc logic to combine this XGBoost like outputs, combine that with the TensorFlow kind of model that we are training. And we, at that time, we used to have an in-house library called as Linchpin, which we had optimized for C++ binding. Like it was a C++ yeah. library for serving. So we used to do in TensorFlow, convert everything into the C++ library. And that was a time when this native serving was not that popular. And I think Pinterest was like before that, like this started to become popular. But now what you see is that you, you have over optimized your libraries and that makes it harder to get away with them. So it took a lot of time and effort in general because you, you want to make sure you get the same performance. There's no bug in mm -hmm. the system. And, and one thing that we see is that when we're doing this kind of setup, like you're writing something in TensorFlow, then you're rewriting code in C++. And that was kind of like also slow down the dev velocity. Like, so now, like once you optimize, super optimize, I think it becomes harder to get away. And I think that's one thing to like probably like you need to be more careful where you're optimizing. And also, I think the industry changes in general, like being able to move out. And I think then we move to TensorFlow. I think we move. So what we did is we removed the XGBoost, we move it to TensorFlow deep neural networks. And around that time, the thing is, since you're making many changes, you might not see the benefit coming out of that migration because at that time you're just focusing on getting a neutral kind of experiment so that you can get out of it like sooner in general. So the first DNN was not that super successful. Like it was just a neutral kind of launch, but since a lot of efforts, I would say like a, more than a year or like kind of effort went in to bring it happen. So you have super optimized, it becomes harder. So then we move from this kind of uh, like a different TensorFlow, C++, XGBoost kind of framework to something where we are training natively in TensorFlow first in general. So we started training in TensorFlow, but we're still realizing on like C++ serving. And at this point, our features were still not unified. Training pipelines were not unified, but we could still use it. So around this time, what happened, like some of the teams got benefits, like they moved to this architecture of TensorFlow serving in C++, but around the same time, there was like more prominent research around like deep cross networks where everything was, feature engineering was moving to models in general. So when we were doing this GBDT transition, we didn't change our features. We are using the same feature transformations and that was limiting our performance. So we moved to having all feature engineering and that was like a completely new idea that we were trying to do. And, and those ideas become harder to push to because you are already moving in one direction with you have something and now like, will it work or will it not work? So you need some dedicated effort and support to bring it happen. So I think we moved to that architecture. We called it internally as AutoML, but today I think AutoML is used for a totally different term. But yeah, internally, I think around that time, those terms were not that common. So I think we were thinking it's automatic machine learning. We are doing automatic feature engineering. So that was the term that we have internally. And yeah, so we moved to that. We are still not doing native serving. So now what happens is that, as we discussed earlier, that you have 20, 50 different models, right? Some of the models would move. Some of those would not move because they are iterated slowly and some things might not work. So now it becomes a big challenge. Like how do you bring your infrastructure ecosystem like totally, like how do you revamp it completely? Because now you're in a world that you have two different ecosystems and then debugging and everything becomes much harder. So you probably want everything to move together. So that happened with like, like the new PyTorch rewrite. So we had like everything rewritten in PyTorch with better, in, like better tooling, better support, better debugging capacities. And that rewrite was much seamless in general, like everyone was able to move together. So once you have a good infrastructure, we also rewrote our training infrastructure to be have like flattened tables. Before that, features used to be like nested features in general, and then extracting their logic, everyone need to write different logics. But I think with this feature store and everything, features move to like, like flattened features, like a unified format where you, how you represent them. And that makes the adoption easier, like, and also debugging easier. So I think the PyTorch rewrite was probably the most fastest rewrite that we've had in general in the companies. And right now, all the models move to it. Like some models skip some of the steps in between because like you can right. get caught up with these changes. But yeah, I think a careful design, I think, which also takes into impact like all the models that would be impacted. I think that that's important in general, like so that you can cater to all the needs and yeah. And, and uh, you mentioned about some of the benefits of this, you know, 
uh, framework native serving that you all have uh, you know started to realize uh, w one question is um, what is what has been some of the key component changes like you know from from say an infrastructure perspective to enable maybe if you can list it down uh, for for the users that enabled you to go from like a c++ native serving a c++ serving to maybe a native serving and if someone is starting today what are some of the things they should keep in mind so that their system right from day zero is actually a, a system that can support different frameworks yeah yeah i think one one important finding i would say is that features like how you do your feature extraction from your feature store i think the more i think we used to have a layer that used to do it between the model itself and the feature store we had a feature pre-processing layers in general but what happens is that that logic might get out of sync in general. So the more you can push that logic either to your feature store itself, or the more you can push it into your trainer, I think that will make it easier to move. Otherwise, you have different components, and then you need to align and make sure the deployments, nothing messes up. So we had some incidents where things might change and might not be what the model is expecting. So, so one, to move most of the feature engineering either to the store so that everyone sees the same kind of feature engineering or towards the model if you need more kind of like feature engineering specific to the model or the system that you're doing. So that's one big push. The other thing I would say is around the data structure storage. Like how do you store your data? Like do you have a lot of pre-processing steps in between or can you move those closer to the model? So the more you move closer to the model, right. if, you can, if you can afford it effectively, like you can probably do many more things. Like if you want to change your sampling strategy, if you want to reduce mm -hmm. like train on some examples you have more flexibility to do different things but the more you have upstream in the funnel like you lose that flexibility because you now have different steps that you need to control so i think there's a big push to move things towards the model trainer in general so that you can control your sampling inside the model but that also means that sampling is performant in general so i think there i think open source versions around ray and stuff that people are looking into in general in the industry but yeah i think I think it also means that advancements that are happening outside, I think sometimes they like if you're talking about it two, three years ago, there were not, not such techniques that you can do to do right. about this. So I think, but keeping track of what's happening, I think that's important. And maybe it might look challenging to transition there, but I think it, it's important in the long run to be able to move to techniques that are more like more useful, unless like you super optimize in one direction. I think it becomes harder. To, to get away in the middle, I would say. Understood. Uh, amazing. Uh, that is great. Uh, any any key things to keep in mind, you know, when, when people are doing these migrations, like, uh, you know, you, you have went through several rounds of migrations. So when do you decide to do it, when not to do it, and what are the things to keep in mind? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think having good tools, I would say, that can compare across. Like, let's say if you're moving from one infrastructure to another, can you have tools that can compare performance and make sure that things that are supposed to be similar remain similar in general? Sometimes what happens also is when we do the migrations, like you might lack support for debugging in the new setup in general. Mm -hmm. If you know these are the tools that you definitely need for debugging or for like let's say monitoring in general, how can you make sure that you have the corresponding or a better technique to do that in the new system? Once you build those tools, I think things becomes much easier in general. Like, like then you can move faster, but let's say if you lack those tools to compare across to, I think then it becomes harder because you don't know where things could go wrong because things would keep going wrong in, in one place or the other. So you probably want to reduce that time to 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 find and fix them. In the end. Got it. And, uh, you know, uh, going, going again to some of the migrations, like, and maybe uh, if, if somewhere were to kind of start building, uh, you know, their ML infra today, uh, what are some of the key things that you will advise that, okay, you know, um, maybe it's good to already take care of some of these things right from the beginning because the pain of migration is too bad. And these are some of the things that maybe can be worried about later. Uh, but it'll be good to kind of get a sense of uh, some of the key principles to keep in mind that should people should, no matter what, start from beginning. And then a few things that can be tackled later on. Uh, yeah, I think I would say like, features like how you're getting your features and data in general like having a more like a streamlined version of getting that instead of having a more complex way to get that and how can you make sure that your features are same between training and serving in general so that you don't have a feature distribution shift that can impact your performance and then like training 
the more modular you can make all of this in general so if someone wants to plug and play different let's say try different things how easy it is to try and evaluate on a baseline that you already have like if you have a baseline how you can evaluate against that more seamlessly in general and then i think though all the support system is important like how do you spin up the jobs how do you make sure that everything is running how you're not exploiting the resources i think those are very important in general but yeah, I think once you start to build pipelines, I think having that ecosystem and support would be really, really important. And I think also tracking metrics, I think that's important because once you start running many models, you lose track of like what, what model. And like if you have a centralized place where you can look at metrics together, you can say easily, it's easier to say like what's working, what not in general. And then a history, I would say something that's looked upon is documentation of what was done in general. So if you have a more seamless way to know, okay, this was already done, this was the takeaway. I think that gets lost in some of the fast pace moving companies in general. Okay. And, and and from a perspective of you know using Kubernetes, like has, has have you all always used Kubernetes and um, you know Dockerization, or uh, was there a point where you kind of shifted and what has been your views on that? Like, yeah, how should people see it today? Like. Uh, the reason I'm asking this is a lot of small companies still prefer to kind of use, you know, raw AC2 machines, etc., uh, for for running the infra. And later on, uh, we have seen companies kind of wanting to move Kubernetes. So, how should people kind of think the balance of whether to use Kubernetes right from day zero or not? Yeah, I think when I joined in '18, like Pinterest was already doing Kubernetes. We already had Docker images. I think it. I think the. I would say the initial. It might take maybe 1.2 times of what other things are but i think there's benefit of doing it in that way in general like as you scale okay. i think it be much much easier to manage your your workload and like it's also the cost i would say like i think because you can choose how you're spending cost in general and have better tracking to in which you lag in your like personal machines in general okay uh great i use any final points like you know it's been a great conversation uh, I know you all are doing a lot of work on the LLM and the Gen AI side. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll catch up later to kind of see what all work is going on. Any final thoughts? Any uh, any specific? Yeah, uh, I think I would share like in my like five years in like industry. I think infrastructure is evolving pretty. Like you need to have a good ML infrastructure, and I'm happy that you're looking into that space in general. So I'm looking forward to what comes next. But yeah, I think having a seamless infrastructure, which makes it easier to do, I think, to bring new applications to in general. One thing is like, if there's a new ML ask, how can you bring it to like to friction like much faster? I think that's important. And I think I'm looking forward to see where you go. Yeah. Thanks for having me here. Awesome. Uh, great to have you, Ayush. Thanks a lot for your time. I uh, really appreciate the same.